Welcome once again to Jesus or Muhammad, possibly the most important show in history. We've got roughly half of the world believing in Jesus or Muhammad, and so it seems there are lots of issues we need to consider. Muslims say one thing, Christians say another. How are we going to settle these differences? Well, we like to discuss them. That's our preferred method. We like to have discussions uh, based on the texts, based on the texts that Muslims believe in, based on the texts that Christians believe in, to see where the evidence lies. And uh, in this series, we're examining the claims of Dr. Zakir Naik, probably the most popular Muslim apologist in the world today. I I've been to uh, debates where Muslims have thrown whoever was representing their position on stage under the bus and said, well, uh, he's not very good. Why don't you debate Zakir Naik? Mm -hmm. Well, we would love to. We would love it if Zakir Naik would actually face, for once in his entire career, an experienced Christian debater. He has never done so. I doubt he ever will. We can only hope that one day, one day, he will decide to defend his claims on a stage with a representative of Christianity who has some debate experience. Love to see that, haven't seen it yet, but we can only hope. Dr. Zakir Naik makes lots of claims about Christianity, about Christian belief, and on this episode, we're going to examine some of his claims about the deity of Christ. Now, we can obviously do several shows on Zakir Naik's claims about the deity of Christ, and it's such an important topic because it's one of the main areas of disagreement between Christians and Muslims that we certainly want to spend a great deal of time on it. Um, but one of the things that we've seen Zakir Naik do is pack a bunch of passages or claims into a, a tight little, uh, little two-minute or one-minute segment and pretend that he has refuted the Christian position. Well, it's easy to do. That's easy to do. We could quote lots of, a lot of quick passages from the Quran very quickly, showing that Islam promotes jihad. The Muslim response would be, well, we need to look a little deeper. We need to look a little deeper at this issue. And all we're saying is, let's, why don't we do that when we examine the Bible? Zakir Naik makes claims about what the Bible teaches. Why don't we look at those claims in context and see what they say? Uh, so that's what we're going to do tonight. I'm David Wood. With me is Sam Shamoon. Sam, how you doing? Glory to Jesus Christ, <clears throat> our God and Savior. And again, <clears throat> I invoke our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to bless you and me in the power of His Holy Spirit, just purifying us in His holy blood and enabling us by His Spirit to speak the truth clearly, to refute lies and falsehood, and do it with a pure motive, solely to see Him exalted and glorified, so that the Lord Jesus will use our meager efforts to strengthen the church and convict Muslims to turn away from this false religion and embrace Jesus as their Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray this. For his glory, may he bless his show. Now, Zucker Naik claims to be an expert on world religions <laughs> and even on Christianity. <sighs> on a scale of <clears throat> 1 to 10, yeah. how would you rate his arguments? Not his ability to woo a Muslim crowd, but on his actual arguments. Scale of 1 to 10, 1 being horrible arguments, 10 being airtight arguments. What you would want you to be as him? honest as possible? Be honest, be honest for the Minus show. Minus 1,000. Wow. <laughs> Not even they, a one, minus. <laughs> they are. You know, they are be honest, right? They, they, they are pretty bad. And, and this seems to be one of the main criteria of being a popular Muslim apologist, the <laughs> ability to spout arguments that on an argument scale are negative 1,000 and be able to convince your Muslim audience that I'm really, man, I'm delivering to you some, some airtight stuff here, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that seems to be the trend, right? That is, that is the trend. That is indeed. But that's because of the, of the gods we serve. Mm -hmm. Our God is a God of truth, who's infinitely holy and pure, and is not honored or glorified when we use lies, deceptions, or distortions to try to promote his message. Who, Whereas, would, be, who would be the greatest deceiver, according to Christianity? Satan. In Revelation 12, 9, he's the one who deceives the whole world. Revelation mm -hmm. 12, verse mm -hmm. 9, he's the one who deceives the whole world. And if you go to, <clears throat> to Jesus' own words in John 8, 44, John mm -hmm. 8, 44, he is the father of lies. When he lies, he speaks his native tongue. So obviously, since that's what Christianity teaches, and Muslims claim that Christians and, and Muslims believe a lot of the same things, uh, and we do on some issues, but obviously we go to the Quran, we're going to find out that Satan is the greatest of deceivers, right? 
Uh, actually, according to the Quran, and I know this may offend some Muslims, and I hope that I don't unnecessarily offend anyone, but I have to speak the truth for the sake of the Lord Jesus, and I hope I do it in a loving manner. I know it's difficult. The Quran says that the best of all deceivers is not Satan. It's Allah himself. Because he's better. He's greater, Yeah, he right? is the best of all those who deceive. So mm -hmm. Satan is one of those who deceive, right? But a better deceiver than Satan, according to the Quran, is Allah because he's khairul makareen. Khairul makareen means the best among those who deceive. There's no one better than Allah. That's chapter 3. But people will tra Muslims will translate that as best of plotters, best of planners, best yeah. of schemers, something well, like that. I, I challenge any and all Muslims to go back and look at how the lexical sources define the term makar. And more importantly, how makar is used in the Quran. It's always used in the negative sense. Mm -hmm. To connive, to scheme, to deceit, right? Mm -hmm. To mislead. Mm -hmm. And in chapter 3, verse 54, chapter 3, verse 54, and chapter 8, verse 30, there Allah twice says that he is the best of all those who perform makr, khairun makreen, mm -hmm. the best of all deceivers. And then in chapter 7, verse 99, it says no one feels safe from the makr of Allah, the deception of Allah, the scheming of Allah, except the disbeliever. Mm -hmm. That means if you're a true believer, then you know better than to feel secure from Allah's mm -hmm. scheming. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we saw just a couple of weeks ago, you actually see this exhibited in what Muslims teach about, say, the crucifixion where Allah actually deceives people into believing that Jesus died by crucifixion, ends up starting what is, according to Islam, the world's largest false religion, Christianity. Allah starts that. If you want to say the gospel's been corrupted, yeah. who corrupted it? Yeah. I open my gospel, I open my Bible, it says Jesus died by crucifixion. You say, oh, that's been corrupted. Who corrupted that? Where did Muslims get the idea Jesus died by crucifixion? From Allah, according to Islam, right? Yeah. He deceived people. This was so great. This, this degree of of Allah's deception was so horrifying to the early Muslim community. Abu Bakr, what did he say? Yeah, he goes, yeah. even if I had one foot, one foot in, paradise. in paradise, I still would not feel safe from the deception, the scheming of Allah, makar Allah. So this is Muhammad's closest companion, one of the four rightly guided caliphs, saying, if I had one foot in paradise, if I were walking into paradise, I would still be terrified that Allah is just tricking me. He's about to throw me into hell. And he was only letting me put one foot in paradise to trick and deceive me exactly. so that my punishment in hell is all that much worse, right? Yep, exactly. This, this, is the God, this is the God that Muslims believe in. And then people wonder why the main apologists of, the main defenders of the God who is the greatest of deceivers, would resort to those kind of would tactics. resort to these kind of yeah. arguments and tactics sheer deception now the the sort of fundamental principle will be going on uh, when we discuss the deity of Christ or any really any other uh, times that Muslim apologists point to passages in the Bible is context and the reason we, we want to point this out here at the beginning is it's shocking how inconsistent Muslims will be if I quote Surah, Surah 9 5 Oh, the Muslims, oh, yeah, huh? what are they going to say? What's the immediate response? Oh, well, you're quoting out of context. Oh, read wait, it in context. Wait. we got to read it in context, right? Yep. In fact, we even see Zakir Naik doing this. We'll play a clip. We even see Zakir Naik doing this when he has to address Surah 9.5. He criticizes people for quoting out of context, for ignoring verses that are part of the passage as a whole. He even criticizes people for, for doing this. Let's go ahead and look at what happens when Dr. Zakir Naik is confronted with a passage like Surah 9, verse 5. Let's look at the clip. If anyone quotes out of context, it will sound absurd. But it is a quotation out of context. It's out of context. And Arun Shuri after verse number 5 of Surah Toba jumps to verse number 7. Any intelligent person knows that verse number 6 has the reply. Now you can see this, you can see things like this of course throughout Dr. Nike's responses and lectures. But think about what he's saying because it's very important and it's something I agree with wholeheartedly. In fact, next week we'll be looking at Surah 9, verse 5, and we'll be looking at it in context. It's historical context, uh, it's immediate context, the immediate context of the passage, what it means in it, what we'd call the greater or extended literary context, what it means in the context of the book as a whole. We'll look at all of those contexts. We agree completely with Zachar Knight that if you're going to quote something like Surah 9, 5, where Muslims are commanded to slay slay the idolaters wherever you find them. Uh, you have to examine the context to make sure you're interpreting it properly. So we agree completely that whether you're, whatever text you're dealing with, if you're going to make a claim about the text, you have to make sure that what you're saying does not contradict the context. In other words, if you 
read a verse and say it means this, when the surrounding context shows it means the exact opposite or something completely different, you're not being honest with the text. You're being deceptive with the text. Guess what? That's true of the Muslim texts, and it's true of the Christian texts. We just saw Zakir Knight. Don't quote it out of context. He even said, if you quote a verse out of context, you, you, you become absurd. Right? Yeah. You're absurd. Exactly. And then he says, any person of intelligence knows that if you're going to quote verse 5 and verse 7, you have to read verse 6, right? Yeah. Any person of intelligence. So what's he saying? Any person of intelligence who reads a verse, he's going to look at the surrounding context, right? Any person of intelligence. Otherwise, you're absurd. So that's the standard we're going to hold Zucker Knight to tonight. Amen. By the if grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yep. If he's quoting something out of context, then he is absurd. <laughs> and if he's ignoring surrounding verses that show the exact opposite of what he's claiming, then he's, he's obviously being deceptive, right? Precisely. And that's what, he, that's what he accuses people of when they do that with the Quran. Yeah. But, but here's what we find. Muslims will have a perfect idea of scripture interpretation when they go to the Quran. They'll at least know the basics, right? You have to look at a passage in context. You have to look at its historical context. You have to look at what the rest of the book says. You have to, you have to look at all of these things, right? They understand that completely. We turn to the Bible and then suddenly, well, context, what's that? Yeah. No, I, I thought you just look around, you search through the pages for something that agrees with your position, and you ignore everything else. Isn't that what you're supposed to do, Sam? Of course. That's the only way to interpret the Bible. What are you talking about? Context? Who needs context? Come on. Yeah. And so there is this horrendous degree of inconsistency. And the question is why? Why can't you Muslims be consistent? And our position, of course, is because you can't be. Yeah. If you were consistent, you would leave Islam. Amen. If you were consistent, yes. you would have to reject Muhammad as a prophet. And so your religion forces you to be inconsistent, to be illogical, to be hypocritical with the criteria you apply. That's certainly the sort of thing we would expect from followers who follow the greatest of deceivers, but it's not what we would expect of the true religion, Amen. right? Exactly. If you serve oh. a God of truth who is <clears throat> not glorified by lies and deception, then the last thing you want to do is distort, pervert, wrench statements out of the context to give a misleading impression, to mislead people into thinking that the passage is saying, saying something other than what it actually says. So, and, and praise the Lord Jesus, our God is a God of truth, mm -hmm. and we'll try not to do that. All right. So we're going to simply look at Zucker Knight's claims and see what they mean in the context, the immediate context of the book, in the context of, of the books as a whole, so if it's Matthew or Luke or John, and in the context of the Bible as a whole. And we'll see, are his claims about what the Bible says, are they accurate according to the context? So let's look at a clip where Zucker Knight just does what he does best, and he does this well, He'll recite a bunch of verses very rapidly, uh, very tightly compact, a lot of verses that sound persuasive, especially to the Muslims. And Muslims usually end by just cheering wildly. Zakir Naik packs those together very well. We're going to unpack them. We're going to unpack them, look at what they mean in context, and then you Muslims can tell us what you think about your apologists. Is this guy your representative? Because if so, that says something. That says something. When your greatest apologist is a tremendous deceiver who deliberately distorts texts, then what does that say about your religion? Well, it says exactly what your Quran says about your religion, namely that it is a religion of deception, right? So let's go ahead and look at a clip where Zucker Naik gives us some rapid fire arguments and we'll see what the verses actually say in context. Let's see our clip. There is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, I am God, or where he says, worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, it is mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, <laughs> verse number 28, he said, my father is greater than I. Hmm? Gospel of John, chapter number 10, huh? verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devils with the Spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20. I, with the finger of God, cast out devil. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. <laughs> you like that, eh? We got to cheer for that. We got we to cheer for that, right? Muslims, yeah. Muslims cheer for that. And I, I really wish, I really wish that instead of just blindly cheering for any random thing Zakir Naik says, that Muslims would actually say, let me go look up all those passages that Zakir Naik just quoted. Let me read them in context and let me see if they're actually denying the deity of Christ, like he just said. And when Zakir Naik claims there's no 
unequivocal, clear statement. In the Bible, he says in the Bible, yeah. where Jesus claims to be God yeah. he or, to the gospel, exactly. or to demand worship. Exactly. Yeah. No, clear, no clear statement anywhere in there. I wish some Muslims would examine that critically instead of just, well, he's saying something that agrees with Islam, therefore we believe it no matter what. Yeah. No matter what. But let's go through these passages, Sam. So we have, <laughs> and it's just hilarious when you think about the references he's using. <laughs> John, when, when you talk about John chapter 14, John chapter 10, oh, man. John chapter 5, anything in the Gospel of John to, to begin with, but specifically 14, 10, and 5, you have to be thinking, what, 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 on what planet does this make sense, right? You're going to the chapters, right? To the very chapters that glorify Jesus most in the book that most clearly, most clearly defends his deity. And you're saying, here is where we have uh, the Islamic view. Jesus is just a prophet, right? Yes. So, <clears throat> Sam, and this one, this one the, the, the one that he quotes first, John chapter 14, verse 28, that's not just used by Muslims, right? No, that's used across the board by all anti-Trinitarians, mm -hmm. uh, specifically those who deny that Jesus Christ is essentially and eternally God. <clears throat> that's one of their favorite mm -hmm. proof texts. Mm -hmm. And why? <clears throat> well, think about what this is saying if we don't read it in context, right? If we ignore the context, we ignore the verses that come before, we ignore the verses that come after, we ignore the context of the book as a whole, which, by the way, begins by saying that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were created through the Word who became flesh, verse 14, became flesh and dwelt among us, right? So yep. you have deity of Christ from all eternity, incarnation, of course, Towards the end of the book, you have Thomas finally recognizing who he is, calling him my Lord and my God. This is the book you're going to go to to prove that he's just a prophet, right? What's wrong with you, man? John only begins in John 5, ends in John 14. What are you talking well, about? Well, I'm, I'm fine. If you want to stick with 5 to 14, are you, are you fine you with going? that? John 20, that's all extra, that? man. What are you talking about? <laughs> let's, stick, let's stick with 5 to 14 then. we got no problem with that, right? Yeah, exactly. So, in chapter 14, verse 28, Jesus says, The Father is greater than I. Now think about this. Christians, we believe that Jesus is God. Here Jesus is saying that the Father is greater than He is. And so that would mean what? Here's Jesus that we claim is God, and here's the Father who's greater than Him. So there's this greater God, right? Exactly. So you have the greater God and the lower God. Christians, we believe in polytheism, right? Precisely. Two gods, one greater than the other. How do All you right. avoid this? Yeah. Now, Sam. Yes. This is probably the most important passage that, that he quoted, so we'll obviously spend a little more time on this passage than on some of the others. But yeah. what happens? What happens when we start looking at this passage in context? Do you get the impression this guy is someone who's just claiming to be a prophet? <clears throat> if you actually read John 14, 28, just within the chapter itself, and again, I trust the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to enable both you and I by His Spirit to do justice to these passages. If you look at John 14, 28 in the context <clears throat> itself, just the chapter, I'm not talking about looking at 13 or 15 or 16. Just look at the chapter itself. Jesus goes out of his way to affirm not only that he's distinct from the Father, he's not the Father, we don't believe Jesus is the Father, but that he's essentially co-equal with the Father in divine nature, <clears throat> power, and glory. <clears throat> in fact, let me just start at John 14, verse 6, for the sake of time. Let me look at verse 6 and show you how Jesus' statements are incompatible with Islam and Jesus' statements prove, from an Islamic perspective, he's claiming to be God. <clears throat> in John 14, 6, the Lord Jesus says, in response to Thomas, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth. In Arabic, al-haq. But anyone can claim that, right? Any, any prophet can oh, claim to be al-haq. We'll, we'll see. We'll see <laughs> if that's the case. I am the way and the truth and the life. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say, I point you to life and I proclaim the truth. I myself am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Number one, Jesus is our way to the Father. Islam denies that God is a Father to anyone. I mean, my goodness, of all the chapters you can quote, you're quoting a chapter where Jesus goes out of his way to affirm God is the Father, especially the Father to the Son. Well, if that's true, then Islam is false, because in the Quran, Allah is a Father to no one, and Jesus is not a Son. For the sake of time, let me just give you the reference. Chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran, you can write down chapter 5, verse 18. Chapter 9, verse 30 of the Quran, chapter 9, verse 30, and then again, chapter 19, verses 88 to 93. Chapter 19, verses 88 to 93, all of which deny that Allah is a father to anyone, that Jesus is a son. The highest relationship you can have with Allah is a slave to master relationship. But beyond that, Jesus claims two of the very names that Islamic theology say belong only to God or Allah. <clears throat> 
Islam boasts about being the strictest form of monotheism known to man. And the term denoting Islamic monotheism is Tawheed. Tawheed. Now, Muslim scholars break down Tawheed in three categories. In order to safeguard Islamic monotheism, you have to affirm these three categories and, and make sure that you don't fail in violating these three categories. Now, for the sake of time, let me mention the third category. It's Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat. Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat. Now, what does that mean? It means that Allah has certain characteristics and names that cannot be ascribed to any creature, no matter how exalted. Beyond that, this category also teaches that Allah's names in their definite form cannot be given to someone. And I'll explain what I mean, that the names of Allah in their definite forms cannot be ascribed to someone. I can say that David is merciful, but I cannot attach the definite article before that. I cannot say David is the merciful. Islamic theology says when you attach the definite article before one of these names, then that can only be attributed to God and God alone. Now, Zakir Nayak believes this because in his website he has an article classifying Tawheed in these three subsets. So he agrees. And, and historically, if you came out and said, I am the truth, you'd be killed. Yes, there Those was actually a Muslim Sufi, Sufi, yeah, Sufi Al-Halaj, yeah. who was killed for saying that. Now, notice Jesus says, I am the truth and the life. Now, chapter 22, verse 6, lo and behold, who is the truth according to the Quran? Chapter 22, verse 6, this is because Allah, He is the truth, right? <laughs> He's the truth, and it is He who gives life to the dead. We'll revisit that issue mm -hmm. of Allah giving life to the dead in a moment. So number one, in context, Jesus claims two of the very exclusive names of God, something no prophet would do. Number two, Jesus affirms that God is the Father. So that's just verse 6. Mm -hmm. What happens when we go to verses 12 and 14? Mm -hmm. What happens when we go to 12 and 14? Well, let's look at it. Same chapter, look what Jesus says. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do. Greater works, same word, greater. Greater works will he do because I am going to the Father. So in John 14, 12 to 14, Jesus says, you disciples will do greater works than me because I'm going to the Father. Now what's the connection? What's the connection with Jesus going to the Father? resulting in the disciples doing greater number of works than Jesus, not better works. The answer comes in the verses following. Here's why. Whatever you ask in my name, this will I do. When I go to the Father, you will ask me, and I will perform these miracles through you <clears throat> at your behest, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now notice verse 14. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. In the very same chapter, Jesus says, you'll be able to do greater works than me when I go to the Father because once I'm in heaven, in the very presence of the Father, you can direct your invocations to me. In Islam, that's known as dua. When you invoke Allah, that's called dua. According to Muhammad in sound traditions, the very heart of worship is dua. Dua, invocation, is the heart of worship. And Islam says, you are not to give worship to anyone except Allah. This is known as Tawheed al-Ibadah, the worship that belongs to God alone. And yet Jesus says to his followers, you can invoke me and I'll answer all your prayers. I'll do it. Now let me ask you a question, David. Mm -hmm. What kind of attributes must Christ have to be able to hear all the prayers offered to him and have the ability to then carry out every specific request? Uh, well, you'd at least need omniscience slash omnipresence, if you're going to be there or something like that. But let's just stick with omniscience and omnipotence, right? So you're telling me in the same chapter Jesus claimed that he's omnipotent and he's omniscient because he made himself the object of invocation and claimed personally, I will do it? Not to mention taking titles of Allah just a couple wow. of verses earlier. That's the same chapter. Yeah, this is the, this is, this is the verse where... Jesus is just a prophet, right? Right, yeah. The, the, remember, Jesus said the Father's good and I, so you can't be God. That's the same chapter, right? All right, what now, else we got? Uh, well, let me just reinforce the fact that the Quran says mm -hmm. that you're supposed to invoke Allah alone. Chapter 40, verse 60. Chapter 40, verse 60, for all you Nayak fans. 40, verse 60. Your Lord has said, call upon me and I will answer you. Surely those who act too proud to do me service shall enter Gehenna utterly object. So the Quran says you are to call upon Allah, make dua to Allah. Jesus says you can make dua to me. Clearly, in that chapter, Jesus is claiming to be more than a prophet. He's claiming to be God. Now, again, what else do we have? Well, John 14, 20 to 23. Talk about omnipresence. Again, for the sake of time, because we want to address other points, mm -hmm. let's just look at verse 23, and then you tell me, what is Jesus getting at? John 14, 23, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. 
My Father will love him, and we, Father and I, we will come to him and make our home with him. Let me ask you a question. Here Jesus claims to be just as present to the same degree in the same sense that the Father is with all who truly love him. What kind of ability must Jesus have in order to dwell with every true believer, no matter where they're at, no matter how many? Well, there you need omnipresence. Seriously? Yeah. So you mean the same chapter, Jesus claimed the divine names of God, Jesus claimed the divine attributes of God, and Jesus made himself the object of worship and invocation, that same chapter? Yeah, because he's just a prophet. Okay. All right. right. And then, isn't it clear that Jesus is claiming to be essentially co-equal to the Father? He's saying, I and the Father together will make our abode with every true believer. Does that sound like someone who thinks that he's less than the Father in essence and ability? Or co-equal to the Father in essence and divine attributes and characteristics? But, well, then what, what could Jesus mean just a few verses later when he says the Father is greater than I? If he's maintaining his ability to answer prayers, his divine names, his divine attributes, and then turns right around and says the Father is greater than I, what, what, what do you do with that? Well, in, in the context we've established, greater does not mean greater in essence in nature or power and ability. Clearly, because you can be greater in one of two senses. You can be greater than me, in essence, like I'm greater than my dog, in essence, or you can be greater than me in rank and position authority. You are greater than your children, right? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't make you a better human being than your children, right? Again, that's, a, that's an imperfect analogy because God is unlike creation. However, it drives the point home. Clearly, in the context, Jesus is not saying that the Father is better than me, in essence. He just has gone out of his way to affirm that he's fully God, and has the same ability and characteristics that the Father has. In, in other words, just to be, just to be clear here and, and to give the Muslims a comparison, when we open up the Quran, as we'll look at next week, we see Surah 9.5, slay the idolaters wherever you find them. You'd say, aha, if you take that as a sentence, that's a perfectly clear sentence, right? It's yep. perfectly well-constructed, clear sentence. Slay exactly. the idolaters wherever you find them. But Muslims will say, well, you can't just look at that sentence. You have to look at the surrounding context to see what that sentence means. Even though if you just read that sentence, you would think it means one thing, in context, you'd say it means something different, right? So if you just consider the words, oh, hey, Jesus, some guy named Jesus said the Father is greater than I. Well, you'd think, oh, okay, he's, he's, he, he means something specific there, right? Well, we would say the exact same, same things that you Muslims would say. Look at the surrounding verses. If your interpretation totally contradicts everything else Jesus says in the exact same passage, you can't be interpreting it right, right? Precisely. So if you say, look, Jesus is saying he's something less than God here, and in the entire surrounding passage, he's claiming over and over and over again to have the names and titles and attributes of God, you can't be interpreting that properly. Exactly. And so a question for us is, well, how do we offer an alternative interpretation that what actually yes. fits the context? Yeah, the, only, fits yeah, the context. The only interpretation that fits the context is right there if you read actually the entire verse. Let me read it, John 14, 28. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father. And here, here's the explanation. For the Father is greater than I. Now notice what he's saying. If you really love me, you'd be happy that I'm leaving you because the Father is greater than I. Well, what's the connection here? You should be happy that I'm going to the Father because of this reason, the Father is greater than I. If you just read it there in isolation, it really doesn't make sense. Well, okay, we know, okay, if you're a prophet, then we know God is greater than you. What is because Jesus' point is simply this. If he remains on earth, he remains in the status and position of a slave, whereas the Father is in glory. The Father is basking in heavenly glory, <clears throat> whereas the Son is on earth in the state of, of humbleness. He's in the status of a servant. So what he's telling the disciples is if you love me, then you would rejoice that I go to the Father, because if I remain here, the Father remains greater in status. But when I return to glory... That won't be the case anymore. That this is what Jesus is saying is easily confirmed by the same gospel in John 17, verse 5. John 17, 5, notice what Jesus says, uh, David. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had. See, had it, doesn't have it now. The glory I had with you before the world existed. So Jesus is telling disciples, if I return to the Father, then the glory I had with him will be mine once again. But if I remain here, he'll remain greater in terms of status and glory. And by the way, can any creature say that he shared in the same divine glory with God before the world was created? Not according to the Bible, he can't. Can he demand that the Father give him back that glory that he had with, with God before the world began? No. But that's what Jesus claimed in John 17, verse 5. Yeah. So the meaning is, while I'm on earth, Jesus is in the status of, of a slave. But when he goes back, that situation will change. 
He'll regain the glory that he had with the Father so that from that point on, the Father won't be greater than him in that sense anymore. So when we read this verse in context, not Zucker Nike's totally distorted, out-of-context interpretation, what we find is that Jesus is God. He had glory with the Father before, the, before anything was ever created. Yep. All things are created through Jesus. The Son, the Divine Son, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Divine Son enters creation, takes on flesh, lives as a servant. Exactly. Then while he's a servant, he has followers. He tells his followers he's about to leave. They're all broken up over it. Oh, you're leaving us. It's so horrible. And he says, you should be rejoicing. Once I go away, I go with the Father. I get the same divine position I had before. I can answer your prayers. You'll know who I really am. Amen. You should be rejoicing right now. I'm not going to be living like a servant anymore. I'm going to be with the Father who's greater in position now that I'm here on earth. You should be rejoicing that I'm going back there. Over this, in context, it is a clear, 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 Amen. consistent Amen. claim to his deity. Zachar Nike rips a little snippet, not even an entire verse, rips a part of one verse out of this entire context and says, you see there, just a prophet. <laughs> Are you guys serious? Is this the best you can do? Because, I mean, I, I have to say, if, if this is the best you can do, wow. Well, if all you can, in other words, look, you got a couple of options here, right? You could look at all of this where Jesus is claiming over and over and over again to be God. And you could say, it's all been corrupted, I reject it. Fine, do that. But that's not what you do. You go quote the, the exact same passages where Jesus is claiming to be God and you rip things out of context. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Remember, remember what your God claims about himself. Your God claims to be the greatest of deceivers. It is, any, is it any surprise that people like Zucker Nike, the greatest apologist, rely on deception as part of their methodology? Is it surprising at all? I don't think it is. All right, we have to take a break. We'll come back. We'll watch that clip one more time, and we'll get to the other claims. We wanted to spend a lot of time on that one because it's important and because so many people use it. We'll come back, and we'll respond to the rest of the claims. See you in a moment here on Jesus or Muhammad. Welcome back to Jesus or Muhammad. We've been discussing Zucker Nike's claims about the deity of Christ. And we just looked at one where Zucker Nike quotes uh, part of one verse and the entire surrounding context says exactly the opposite of what Zucker Nike says. Now, what does this mean? It means that he is taking things out of context. But wait a minute, when we do that with the Quran, yeah. he, he, he says, oh, oh, it's absurd and any person of intelligence wouldn't do that, remember? He says that about 9.5. Yeah. Any person of intelligence is going to read 9.6. Well, Zachar Nike, any person of intelligence is going to, if you're quoting John 14, 28, is going to read the rest of John 14, right? <laughs> any person expect. of intelligence. Yeah. Exactly. He, that's, that's his criterion, not ours, right? He said that. Yep. He said that. Christ. And we agreed with him. And then what? And then he totally, he totally violates his own principles of interpretation when turning the Bible. Why? Because you Muslims have to. You don't have a choice in the matter. Your religion forces you to be inconsistent. And this is why deceptive apologists such as Zakir Naik tend to rise to the surface in Islam. Now, Zakir Naik addressed four more claims. In fact, let's go ahead and watch that clip one more time just so we can have his claims in mind. And then we kind of have to go rapid fire through these remaining four, but they're shorter so we can do that. Uh, so let's see that clip one more time. There is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, I am God, or where he says, worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, it is mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, he said, My father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, My father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devils with the Spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20. I, with the finger of God, cast out devil. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. All right, John chapter 10, verse 29. Jesus says, my father is greater than all. And that is that That's clearly it. contradicts Ace. Christianity where... Uh, apparently we don't believe the Father is greater than all. So what, what, yeah. what do you do with that passage? Obviously, he's trying to use that to show that Jesus again mm -hmm. reiterates the fact that the Father is greater than him. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's the last thing Jesus had in mind. If you just read 27 to 33, again, let me read this real quick, <clears throat> do justice to the context, but again, move on to the other points as well, but the time allotted to us. My sheep hear my voice. This is John 10, 27 to 33. And I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. Does that sound like a creature, a prophet? 
No. I give them eternal life. Yeah. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. That is a claim of being omnipotent, that Jesus is saying he's so powerful that there is no power in all creation to pluck his followers from his hand of protection, guaranteeing their eternal salvation. Does that mm -hmm. sound like a creature? No. Uh -uh. Well, let's continue. <clears throat> My Father who has given, to the, given them to me is greater than all, in the context greater than anyone who would attempt to snatch the sheep out of Jesus' hand. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Did you catch that, David? Mm -hmm. The Father and I are one in the sense that no one can pluck our followers from either one of our hands. Does that sound like a person who thinks that he is infinitely inferior to the Father? Or does that sound like a person who thinks that he is essentially co-equal to the Father, just as powerful as the Father is in guaranteeing the preservation of his followers and being able to give every one of them eternal life? What does that sound like? Uh, certainly doesn't sound like someone who thought he was just a prophet. Exactly, right? How did the Jews understand him? If you continue reading to 33, it says, At this they picked up stones to stone mm -hmm, him. Mm -hmm. Why? Jesus says, Many good works I've shown you from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? Notice their response. For good work we don't stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, a man, make yourself out to be God. And doesn't Jesus, immediately after that, call himself the Son of God? Yes, exactly. So let me get this straight, Sam. I mean, and by the way, there, there are tons of, of other interesting things in this chapter alone, let alone yes. the rest of the Gospel of John. But what we, what we see already, just with a brief, rapid-fire response, Zucker Knight quotes a verse where if you just read the surrounding verses, you see Jesus claiming to be the Son of God, claiming that he can give eternal life to his followers, that no one can snatch his followers away from him. And this, oh, is, this refutes the deity of Christ, right? Exactly. And by the way, what, what, what would Muhammad do if God actually had a son? What would Muhammad do, according to the Quran? According to chapter 43, verse 81 of the Quran. This is not the Christian Bible. This is the Quran. Chapter 43, verse 81 says that if the most merciful, the beneficent, had a son, I would be the first to worship him. So if God had a son... Muhammad says, if God had a son, I would be the first to worship him. Zakir Naik just quoted a passage. He obviously believes it's authentic, right? He obviously believes Jesus is saying this. And when we read it in context, Jesus says what? He claims to be the son of God. So since Jesus claims to be the son of God in a passage that has Zakir Naik's stamp of approval, we can say Muhammad, if he had been aware of this passage like Zakir Naik, he would have been the first to worship him. Muhammad apparently wasn't aware of these passages. He couldn't read. But you Muslims now know about this passage. And so you, following the advice and example of your prophet, now have to worship Jesus. You have to. Exactly. In fact, David, I want to just one real quick point. Why did the Jews assume that Jesus' language meant he was claiming to be God? And here's why. They knew their Old Testament. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Remember, Jesus says, I give them eternal life. Not just life, but eternal life. No one can deliver them out of my hand. Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I, even I, am He, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive, gives life. I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. Do you see why the Jews concluded that the language that Jesus used to describe His relationship to the Father is language that belongs only to one who's truly God? And they weren't convinced He's God, so they thought He was blaspheming. Mm -hmm. Could it be any clearer? Mm -hmm. All right, so that one isn't very difficult at all. Once again, it's just reading the context and understanding what, the, what context this has in Christian thought. Uh, now we have Matthew and Luke oh, yeah. in passages that are saying basically the same thing. In Matthew 12, verse 28, Jesus says, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And we turn to Luke 11, verse 20, and we read, but if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Yes. He's quoting these as separate uh, examples of Jesus denying his deity. Um, what do you think, Sam? Uh, well, How would you respond to these? I don't really think much of his uh, distortion of the text, but uh, the assumption... Way, this would be... This would, <laughs> Christians would look at this and say, of course, right? Yeah, right of course, yeah. we believe this, right? The, the assumption is that if Jesus Christ operates in perfect union with the Father and the Spirit, in accomplishing his ministry, somehow that means that he's not God or he's not doing it in his own divine power. For the record, let me just explain what Christians believe. We believe that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit always work in perfect union with one another. They're not three separate gods who act ind independently from one another. 
There are distinct persons who exist as one God, and as, as, as one God, they always work in perfect union. Mm -hmm. So here you have a passage, Jesus simply affirming that it's by the Spirit he does these miracles. Mm -hmm. You have another passage that says God the Father did it through Jesus Christ. But then the same Jesus also says that he's the one doing the miracles. So is it either or or both and? Is it the Father or is it the Son or is it the Holy Spirit doing the works? According to Jesus in the New Testament, all three are mm -hmm. doing the works together in perfect union. That's why I'm a Trinitarian. In fact, let me just prove that from the very same gospel of Luke that he quoted. Luke 10, 17 to 20, the chapter before Luke 11, 20. No, no, notice this, Luke 10, 17 to 20. Look what Jesus says in response to what the disciples say to him after a successful mission. Luke 10, 17 to 20. The 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, calling Jesus Lord, forbidden in Islam to call anyone besides Allah Lord. Even the demons are subject to us in your name. Mm -hmm. Did you catch it? In your name, we invoke your name, your authority, your power, and demons are subject to us. Does that sound like a mere prophet? Not a Muslim prophet. When's the last time you hear someone saying, in the name of Muhammad, or even if we go with true prophets, in the name of Moses. No, it's in the name of God and God alone. But here, the disciples say, in your name, invoking your power, your authority, your name, we got results. We did miracles. And what does Jesus respond? If he's a good Muslim, he should have rebuked them, right? He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold... I have given you authority, I have given you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Did you catch it? Mm -hmm. I have given you the power to do miracles and to conquer the enemy. Power that comes from my name. That sure sounds like the miracles are being wrought, not just in the name of the Father or by the power of the Father or the power of the Holy Spirit, but also in the power and name of Jesus Christ. To further confirm that, Luke 9, 49 to 50, watch this, Dave. Luke 9, 49 to 50. Same gospel that Zechariah quoted, Luke 9, 49 to 50. John answered, Lord, we saw something, someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow us. But Jesus said to him, do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. So here's a person who's not part of the apostolic band, but has heard about Jesus and uses Jesus' name to successfully cast out demons. Does that sound like Jesus thought of himself as a mere prophet or that those around him thought he was a mere prophet? Or does that confirm what we believe as Trinitarians, that the Father and the Son and the Spirit together, as the one God, wrought the miracles that Jesus performed while he's on earth? Exactly. So it seems what we have here is Muslims begin with a distorted view of what Christians believe, right? Yep. They start off assuming Unitarianism, right? One God, one person. Then they assume that when we say Jesus is God, we're saying that he is only God, right? He's, he, he's the only person that is God, right? And therefore, no other, yeah. when he makes all these claims or stuff like that, it's just incoherent babble. When in reality, in reality, we believe in a triune God, the Son enters creation at the incarnation, takes on human flesh, lives as a man, as a human being, and yet makes claims that only makes sense in light of Trinitarian theology, exactly. ultimately does his work and so on. And so when Muslims, Muslims will open up the Bible and say, look, here's a passage where Jesus is talking like he's just a man. Right, we believe that. Amen. You're not startling us. You're not, oh, really? Oh, Amen. a passage where Jesus, that, that almost sounds like he became a man. <laughs> right? Wow, yeah. that, thank you, thank you, right? Yeah, I didn't and know other, that, yeah. yeah, and so when you, but the, the, the Muslims, the Muslims will take all of these passages that confirm that Jesus is a man or that Jesus uh, speaks about the Father or something like that. And they'll say, you see there? Right. Keep reading, Muslims. That's exactly what you would tell us to do if we pulled a verse out of context in the Quran. You'd say, keep reading. Right. And what you do is when you look at all of the claims made by Jesus, not just the ones that you like to pull out of context, when you look at all of his claims, you find no one, no one, can make sense of these passages except in the light of the doctrines of the Trinity and the Incarnation, right? Exactly. In other words, all these verses, regardless, the ones Muslims use, the ones Muslims don't use, they make perfect sense in light of Trinitarian theology and don't make sense at all outside of that context. 100%. And great, we believe that. That's exactly what we believe. All right, one more that's actually along the same lines. It's actually along the same lines of yeah. ignoring the context of the Incarnation yeah, and Trinitarian theology. Yeah, this one is a theology. nightmare for Islam. Yeah, I don't know why. Well, anyway, I do know why, because of the spirit that controls... <laughs> But go ahead. Let's read, let's read the verse. Now, here you have it. Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 30, I can do nothing on my own initiative. You see there. You see there. Jesus can do nothing yeah, on oh his own. I mean, answer. look. I mean, if Jesus was God, he'd be able to do all kinds of things on his own, right? Independent of the Father. Yeah. Right? If he was a separate God. Precisely. Right? 
<laughs> but, but obviously, right here, in John chapter 5, Sam. I'm stumped. You got me. In John me. chapter 5, Jesus is claiming he's not God. What, what are we going to do with that one? I don't know. I'm probably going to become Muslim. No. Uh, I'll would, 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 would we say what Zucker Knight says? Would we say, hey, maybe try reading the rest Precisely. of that passage here? The context, right? Uh, and God forbid, uh, <clears throat> may we always be in love with the Lord Jesus Christ forever. But <clears throat> very easy. If you want to understand what Jesus did not mean and you want to see what he meant, the context of this particular passage actually starts, if you really want to go in context, verses 16 all the way to 30. However, for the sake of time, I'm just going to look at a few representative passages to see what Jesus was actually communicating. Let me just read John 5, 19 to 20 for starters, <clears throat> because we have some time we can actually break this down, because it's the final argument. <clears throat> and I pray by the grace of God we'll do justice to the context. John 5, 19 and 20. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son, notice he's the Son again, can do nothing of his, of his own accord. Now, if I stop there, clearly Jesus is a limited, finite creature. Mm -hmm. Son can't do anything on his own accord. But let me finish it. But only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Two things. <clears throat> Jesus is the Son, and God is his Father. Islam is false again. Mm -hmm. Quran says, Allah is not a Father, and Jesus is not a Son. Secondly, Jesus says, the only thing I can do, because I can't do anything else, the only thing I can do is whatever God does. And whatever he does, I can do it exactly like him. For the life of me, does that sound like a creature? Yeah, would Muhammad ever say, whatever Allah does, I can do that too. And I can only do what Allah does. Yeah, I can only do what Allah does. I can't do anything else. Or does this not, sound... Not, notice it's not, I can only do what God teaches or something like that, right? What yeah. God proclaims as his commandments. It's, I can only do what God does. And I can do it. But wait, that affirms that, number one, the Father and Son are not two distinct separate deities, each doing his own thing. It affirms they're inseparable and perfect union, and that's what I would expect if the Bible teaches the Trinity. The Father is, in divine essence, ability, majesty, and glory, etc., because only God, Jesus, to do whatever, is not the Father. To do things that only God can do, to do things that only, and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he, and greater works than these will he show him, so that, notice some of the greater works, that the Father shows the Son so the Son can do. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom He will. See, the Father raises the dead and gives life. Likewise does the Son. And the Son can give life to whoever He wants to give it. That sure sounds like the Son is co-equal to the Father and sovereign over creation. And didn't we already see Jesus claiming that He can give eternal life? It's all kind of fitting together here, isn't it? Mm, sounds okay. like a Trinitarian book. Okay, well. Since we're talking about raising, raising dead and giving life, let me just skip real quickly to 25 and then 28 to 29. Remember, 28 to 29 precede verse 30, right? Now let me read 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Notice, it's not the voice of God the Father. The voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So whose voice will they hear? The voice of the Son of God. Hearing his voice will give them spiritual and physical life. That shows you that Jesus is all-powerful. In fact, his voice is all-powerful because just at the sound of his voice, people come to life. Now, 28, 29. Now, watch this. These were the verses that precede verse 30. 28, 29. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. In the context, whose voice was that, David? That's Jesus. The voice of the Son of God. Those in the tombs will hear the voice of the Son of God and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. You know why that's an astonishing statement from a Muslim perspective? Jesus says at the sound of his voice, the Son of God, the dead in their tombs come to life at that hour. Let me read to you what the Quran says. Pay attention to the Quran. Chapter 22, verses 6 to 7, Nayak, this is what it says about Allah. That is because Allah, chapter 22, verse 6 to 7, he is the truth. He is, he is the one who gives life to the dead. And it is he who is able to do all things. And surely the hour is coming. There is no doubt about it. And certainly Allah will resurrect those who are in their graves. Mm -hmm. The hour comes where Allah will raise the dead from their graves. Jesus says when the hour comes, it will be him, the Son of God, who will do so. Mm -hmm. And those are the verses that immediately precede verse 30. So Zakar Naik quotes verse 30. I can do nothing on my own initiative. And he ignores all the rest of the passages where Jesus is claiming to do things that even according to the Quran, only Allah does. Exactly. Right? Yeah. See, I'm convinced I'm a Jesus is a Muslim prophet. Yeah. Oh, well, there, there are two more verses here I wanted to read. Sure. You skipped over 22 and 23. Yeah, that was the but, next one. But, but, go but, ahead. but Zakir, right? 
our good friend Zachar Nike, he said, Jesus doesn't, doesn't, people don't have to worship Jesus according to the Bible, right? Not according to the Bible. Well, certainly lots of passages we could go to. Our time is short, but we'll, we'll, uh, we, we want to hit a couple of things here. Since this is a chapter that Zachar Nike himself brought up, think about what Jesus says here. Because he actually condemns Islam and asserts his own deity, right? Yeah. In this passage that your apologist went to. Zachar Nike didn't say, oh, the Bible's all corrupt, and especially John chapter 5, John chapter 10, John chapter 14. Don't trust those. He said, no, these are the passages I use to support Islam. Okay. Let's see how these passages support Islam. John chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. Father, Son again, and Son is the one who judges. Why? Why has all judgment been committed to the Son? He tells us in verse 23. So that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. This is the passage Zachary Nike went to, Same right? One, yeah, yeah, this exactly. is John chapter 5. This is where your apologist went to. This is where your debater went to, John chapter 5, right? So if he went to this passage to prove his view, we can go to the same passage to show what it actually says, right? Yep, yeah. What does Jesus just, say here? He is the final judge, right? The same, yeah, thing, yeah. same thing he says in Matthew. And one He's of the, the names of judge. Allah is Al-Hakim. He's the judge. Yeah, according to the Quran, Allah is the final judge, right? right. Same thing according to the Old Testament. (laughs) God is the final judge. Here Jesus is claiming, wait, careful, understand, father and son here. Son is the one who's actually going to judge people. And Jesus, Jesus says that he's the one who judges. Why? So that all will honor the son just as they honor the father. Sam? Yes. Muslims don't even believe in father and son, right? Exactly. So can they even honor the son as they honor the father? No, because to do so would bring them outside of the fold of Islam. <clears throat> to acknowledge that the Father and the Son are both divine and worthy of the same devotion and worship means that Islam is false, Muhammad is a fraud, he's an antichrist. Because the Quran says Allah is not a father, Jesus is not the Son. And chapter 18, verse 110, you know what it says? Chapter 18, verse 110, when Muhammad is asked to do supernatural works, he says, say, I am only, his God is commanding him to say, I am only a mortal like you. It is revealed to me that your God is one God, so let him who hopes for the encounter with his Lord Work righteousness and not associate with his Lord's service anyone. Do not worship anyone with his Lord if you're God-fearing. So Muhammad says no one can be worshipped alongside his Lord. Jesus says he's the divine son who must be honored the same way that God the Father is. And therefore Jesus claiming to be a necessary object of devotion and worship. So in context, when we look at what Jesus is saying in context, because remember, if you read a verse and you give an interpretation that totally contradicts the surrounding context, you're obviously being deliberately deceptive or just completely ignorant. So take your pick with Zucker. He's either completely ignorant, he hasn't read the rest of the chapter, or he is deliberately deceptive. He knows what the rest of the chapter says, and he's deliberately ripping a verse out of context to deceive his followers. Yep. Right? Which one is it, Muslims? Got to be one or the other. Notice. What we pointed out, if you examine this in context, Zachar Nike's interpretation does not fit. Jesus is claiming over and over and over again, like a beating drum in this passage, to be God. So what can he possibly mean? I can do nothing on my own initiative. The point of this, is it not, is Jesus is making all of these claims about being divine. Someone's obviously going to get the idea, wait a minute, is he claiming to be some other God? Some independent deity, another deity. And so he points out, no, 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 no. No, 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 I'm not some rogue deity. I'm not some independent God. I can't do anything on my own initiative. Why? Because I'm not a separate God, Precisely. one with the Father. This all makes perfect sense, doesn't as, it? As a Trinitarian, because as Trinitarians, we believe the three distinct persons always and only work in perfect union. In fact, Jesus says the same thing about the Holy Spirit in John 16, mm-hmm. 13. He says he will not speak on his own initiative. He'll only speak what he hears. Did you catch that? Mm-hmm. Here the Holy Spirit, like the Son, can only speak, can only communicate, can only do what the Father and the Son determine. Why? Because the three distinct persons are not rebel deities doing their own thing. They're three di- distinct persons who exist as one God, and as one God, their unity is perfect and inseparable. That's mm-hmm. what the Bible teaches. That's why we're Trinitarian. Mm-hmm. So, Zachar Nike has claimed, nowhere does Jesus claim clearly that, it, clearly that he's God. What do you do with all of these passages where Jesus is saying things that even according to the Quran, only God can do? Even in this passage, where yeah. we have to honor Jesus, exactly the same way we honor the Father. One of the ways we honor the Father is through worship, right? Precisely. So, so according to this passage, we would have to worship Jesus we as have well, to right? Pray to Him, worship Him, invoke Him, right? Make our supplications. Is it any surprise that Jesus' followers worshipped Him during His earthly ministry, 
after his death, but before his ascension, and then after his ascension, exactly. according to the New Testament. Makes perfect sense. All right, now, Sam, we have less than two minutes left, so we're going to do this rapid fire, what? rapid fire. We've shown where Jesus is claiming to be God. We've shown where Jesus is demanding worship here, obviously. Uh, let's do one quick, one quick argument, because Zachar Nike says, nowhere does Jesus oh, yeah. claim to be God. So, let me read a passage from the Quran very quickly. I'll read Surah 57, 1 through 3. Whatever is in the heavens and on earth, let it declare the praises and glory of Allah, for he is the exalted in might, the wise. Yes. To him, to who? To Allah, belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. Read, uh, read the ending of the Gospel of Matthew if you want to see who's got dominion, according to Jesus. Uh, of the heavens and the earth, it is he who gives life. Wait, didn't Jesus say he gives eternal life? Precisely. It is he who gives life and death, and he has power over all things. He is the first and the last, the evident and the hidden, and he has full knowledge of all things. So right here, Allah is the first and last. Why? According to Islam, he's the first, nothing before him. He's the last, nothing is after him. Does the Old Testament agree? Precisely. Isaiah 44, verse 6. Isaiah 44, verse 6, and Isaiah 48, 12. Isaiah 48, 12. There Jehovah, Yahweh says... He is the first and the last, and there is no other God besides him. Yes, the Old Testament agrees. That title, first and last, belongs to God and God alone because that implies that he's beginningless and all, you know, all existent. He's ever existing. He's eternal. So according to the Quran, Allah is the first and the last. According to the Old Testament, Yahweh, the one true God, is the first and the last. Zachar Nike says nowhere in the Bible. Yeah. Does Jesus he make didn't a claim to the deity? the Gospels. He yes. said Bible. Anywhere in the Bible. So is there anywhere in the Bible? Where we could point to that would uh, Revelation 1, 17 to 18. Revelation 1, 17 to 18. He goes, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. He placed his right hand upon me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, I live forevermore. And I hold the keys to death and Hades. I am the first and last. I am the living one who was dead and came to life. So who's talking in context? Jesus Christ. So this is Jesus claiming to be the first and the last. Is that something anyone else can claim? Only God and God alone. Only Allah according to the Quran and only Yahweh according to the Old Testament can make that claim and be speaking the truth. Jesus claims that about himself. Is revelation in the Bible? Yes. But nowhere in the Bible according to Zachar Naik does Jesus claim to be God. Where do you get these guys, Muslims? Where do you get these guys? So we just, look, we just looked at Zachar Naik's Obviously, if he's, if, he's, if he's under pressure, time is short, he's going to come out with his most powerful verses showing that Jesus did not claim to be God. We looked at all of his most powerful Islamic-charged verses, and what did we find? Every single one of them, if you look at it in context, gives the opposite view that Zachar Naik is putting forth. So what do you do now? Do you say it's okay to rip verses out of context? If so, don't complain when people do that with the Quran. Or are you going to be consistent and say, look... We demand, we demand that people read the Quran in context, and so we would expect our apologists to live according to the same standard, and now we have to reject Zucker Nike as either completely ignorant, he has no clue what he's talking about, or he is a terrible deceiver. Take your pick, Muslims. Take your pick. But until, until, until you give us an answer here, until Zucker Nike comes out and defends his claims and shows that he's being accurate in context, we can only conclude that since these people are the ones you're putting forward as your great champions, wow, that tells us a lot about your religion. So those of you Muslims out there who are sincere and looking for the truth, you can see beyond a shadow of a doubt, your greatest apologists are the ones who are most deceptive with the text. And that tells us something and it is exactly what we would expect from a God who claims, who boasts about being the greatest of deceivers. Well, we invite you. We invite you to reject the greatest of deceivers and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the truth, Hallelujah. not the worst Amen. of deceivers. Until next time, we'll, uh, we'll be praying for you, and we love you, and we hope you'll pay attention. Learn these arguments because you will, be, you will confront them. Christians out there, you will see these arguments over and over again. Pray that you'll learn this material and that you'll put it to good use. That's why we're doing it. See you next time on Jesus or Muhammad.